eCar membership meeting. Never expected this. Um, uh, it's before we get into the meat and potatoes of the call today, I wanted to remind everybody that um, CTR has been a, uh, a lightning rod for information for us as realtors. They've done an outstanding job um, and it has not been a regular Monday through Friday thing. They've been cranking seven days a week and they have, uh, as everybody knows, gotten Connecticut to be deemed essential services. Uh, the newest change has been that they've gotten uh, photographers to be essential services. So now we can get our professional photography done. But in return for that, uh, just so that you have the latest, most accurate information, because this stuff comes out literally any, any day of the week. Um, please, if you have not already done it, and you can just double check if you did it, in your phones, if you pull out your phone, text the word or the letter CTR, CTR, and the phone number is 52886. So that's 52886. Susie will put that in chat for me. That would be awesome. Um, and it's just an opt in process. So uh, it's not going to get abused. You can stop it at any time. The second thing is um, I'd like to introduce Marisol. Welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us about yourself. Well, um, my name is Marisol. I came from Tri County Alliance of Realtors. I was the AE there for about five and a half years. And now happy to be here as the member services director at ECAR. Looking forward to many years with you. And, and, and Mary, Marisol, you cross-pollinated for what, 30 days, Mary Lou? <laughs> uh, yeah, about 30 days. <laughs> uh, awesome, awesome. Three weeks before we had to be quarantined. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome aboard. Welcome to the ECAR family, Marisol. And uh, let's see, can we get it 30 years, 30 years out of you? Sure. Awesome. <laughs> I'm up for it. Awesome. Um, I'd like to also remind uh, everybody that uh, the uh, salespeople um, CE cycle ends May 31st. Um, there are no extensions. There are no exceptions. Uh, we have a full lineup of, um, of virtual online classes, including the mandatories, and uh, definitely uh, get it done. Uh, you've got spare time on your hands and I would highly recommend, um, you know, using eCar online resources as opposed to others. Also, uh, the blood drive today was canceled. We will hopefully get that, um, uh, you know, rescheduled in the near future when we get things back a little bit more to normal. Uh, we are scheduling and have scheduled a Realtors Give Back. Um, free shred it event. And if you remember the, the standards, we have to hold our records for a total of seven years. So find your files, find your boxes, and you've got um, a maximum of, um, I think it's three boxes, Susie, is that correct? Uh, yep. Yep, so three boxes. And at that same event, we're gonna have a, a drop-off bin for, um, for the, um, canned goods and we're going to get that Gemma uh, Moran. yep yep we're going to have the uh, uh Gemma Morin food bank uh donation from eCar this is going to be June 6th uh from 10 a.m to 1 p.m it'll be up on the website and we'll try to remind everybody about it and that's uh, a Saturday so uh rain or shine uh masks and social distancing in place we figured it could be done outside, so uh, we, we hope to get a lot of participation. It'll be spread out. It's free to anyone in the community, um, and if you guys want to set up a bin in your own office and advertise the flyer and collect cans, it can be an eCar-wide, membership-wide um, event, so thanks in advance for that. Right, and I've got uh, just a couple more to admit. Okay, so then the uh, rolling on, we're also going to have our award bank our awards banquet um, is scheduled for June 10th, and that's still at the Norwich Inn and Spa. Um, we'll play it by ear. We'll see, you know, what the status is, you know, going forward as we get closer to that event. And if the date does need to change, eCar, of course, will change it. And I'd also like to uh, extend uh, a special thank you 
to our annual sponsors. We've also got Keith Turner. I can see Keith over there, unmuted, ready to go. Keith, take it. Hey, hey guys, uh, just wanted to say thanks. Um, we are completely paperless over at our, at our end. Pam and I are still in the office, but all the underwriters, processors, everybody's working from home there with their laptops. So we're, we'll, we are full steam ahead for you guys. Um, one thing just on a, on a side note is if you have any clients asking about uh, forbearance um, or thinking about forbearance, mention to them possibly thinking about refinancing first. If they, are, if they, do, re, if they do go into forbearance, um, what we've been finding out is that a lot of investors are not letting them um, or won't let them buy a new house or, re or refinance for 12 months after they come out of that forbearance. So uh, just something to, to mention to your clients if they are possibly thinking about that. There are other avenues. Um, but yeah, from the purchase standpoint, we, we are, uh, we're full steam ahead. We're doing the prequels over the phone applications either over the phone or in person you know we like to be as much in person as possible um and uh yeah we we're we're uh, here for you guys we haven't really seen much of a um slow down processing wise uh still getting used to this zoom thing figuring out i keep wanting to look at myself i have to realize i got to look at the camera but uh but yeah and, and best of luck to everybody out there be safe thanks thank you keith and um the last of our gold sponsors, uh, Sunrise Home Inspection. I'm going to circle back over to platinum sponsor, uh, Peck and Tineski. John is on the call. John, are you unmuted? Can you, do you want to take a second to say anything? Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> I've never been one to say no to a camera or a chance to talk, so. Um, no, I just, I just want to wish everybody well uh, during these difficult times. Um, obviously things are changing and some things are going to stay sim stay the same and some things are going to change back to the way they were, but, uh, hopefully everybody's well and obviously business is still pretty good. So that's all I got. Thank you. And good luck to everybody. Awesome, John. Thank you. And, uh, with that, Susie, do we have Paula on the call yet? We do. Awesome. Well, today is a, a special day because I want to thank the members of our forms committee. I uh, also want to thank the uh, members of our, um, the, the board of directors because both those committees have uh, worked really hard on this. Uh, we all know that the eCar forms are the best forms, um, and our favorite forms for most of us. And it doesn't mean that we just sit and rest on our laurels. We have looked at the forms and we found that it can be better. And uh, our co-counsels, um, John and Andrew, um, have looked at it along with the committee uh, made up of uh, your peers. And I want to turn it over to Paula, um, chair of the forms committee, and let her take you through the brand new eCar form, which will go into effect on Friday, May 1st, this Friday. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope all is faring well with our recent pandemic and everything that's going on with our business. Um, so we have uh, not had idle hands. Um, we've been working on a purchase and sales agreement now for about a year and a half. We had, if you recall, we did do a major change to it a couple of years ago, about three years ago now. Um, and um, so we had a chance to listen to our membership hear you as far as things that you felt were not as good or could be better on the new form. Um, and, um, you know, some changes here that we needed to align with the way we do business, not, uh, and not the way the form states. So uh, I'm going to run you guys through a few of the changes. There were some other changes made that were more, uh, you know, some wordsmithing and some, uh, just some, some, uh, you know, changing of, of some of the way we modified uh, the language, but uh, for the most part, I'm just going to run you through the, the big stuff. So um, to just start off um, looking at some formatting items, one of the things, if you'll notice, uh, like for instance, on section one here under C, uh, I'm sorry, under B, it says by additional deposit on or before. 
Now before it used to have a line, a comma, a another line, and then a 20, and then you put in 2019, 2020, 2021. We eliminated that because it, um, it wasn't working really well with our electronic programs. And also if you eliminated that in there and you just left a line, um, we've also uh, going to make it effective so that when you're filling this out, say electronically, you'll be able to put text in there as well. So there are instances and occurrences, and I'm talking about in all different areas of the contract under mortgage contingency, the appraisal contingency section, even the closing area where it used to have that in there, where you may need to put something in text um, rather than actually a specified date. Um, so we wanted to give our membership that ability to do that. And so that's what we've done with with any place where there's a date in the contract. Um, another change that we made um, is from now on, there's uh, at the bottom of the, uh, the document, you'll notice that we've taken out the dates. So if you look at um, under buyer's initials, there's three now, and then there's no place to put a date in here on pages one, two, and three. Uh, when we get to page four, when I scroll down, you'll see that there is a place for a date there. Because um, obviously you need a date on the document, but having different places where you put in dates could get confusing, especially if things were dated at different times. And so that everybody's aware of what actually for that specific document, it's always for the last person who signed it. Um, we're eliminating where you put dates and you just put it right at the, at the last page and that way it should pass through FA <laughs> loans and other kinds of loan requirements. There's no question. Um, like I said, there is an additional third buyer and seller signature line. Um, we were able to add an additional one just in case there's more. Um, and uh, so that's it for like the, the, the formatting stuff. Let me get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts of some of the other areas. So section two is where you're going to start seeing some of the bigger changes we've made under financing. Before we used to have just the options of a transaction or a mortgage finance transaction. We've actually added a third item here and you'll see it says the buyer's ability to close is contingent upon the sale of buyer's property and that you can add in that addendum so that um, it, everybody knows right up front, uh, there's no question on whether or not the buyer needs to sell a property in order to purchase this one. Um, so you check that box, you put the appropriate addendum with it, and everything's on page one, which is what our, our goal is, is to have as much information on page one as we possibly can so you can make some decisions. Um, also, let's see, under this section, uh, we just cleaned it up a little bit under the renovation type. Um, I believe it was a little bit, um, not, not exactly right. It had said, I think, 203K. Um, it, it alluded to just an FHA or a VA 203K. We, there is actually no such thing as a VA 203K. Um, and we wanted to make it and open it up to any kind of renovation type. So you can do a conventional loan that has a renovation portion or a USDA that potentially could have one or a VA or, or perhaps it's a completely different type of a product. Um, so we did open that up so that you can check as many of these that apply to your specific transaction, check off renovation type if you need to and throw that in. Speaking of renovation type, we also added um, under the paragraph for your mortgage contingency, it's pretty much the same, except the last paragraph. If you look, the last paragraph states that for the renovation loan financing, this agreement is contingent upon a mortgage commitment and the buyer's acceptance of additionally required improvements is determined by the lender on or before the mortgage commitment date. And the reason we decided to add that, par that little sentence is because if you have a buyer that is um, interested in purchasing a property and say their, um, their specific wants and needs for this property are to, uh, I don't know, paint the interior and add a kitchen, you know, do a new kitchen, appliances, that sort of thing. And that's really the extent of what they were gonna do with the renovation loan. And say during inspections, it comes up that septic system needs to now be replaced. And that's gonna eat up a quite a bit of their budget for their kitchen and painting. Now the buyer, if we didn't have the sentence, is sort of um, pigeonholed into doing the loan uh, and doing the transaction anyway, because they still can. But in this way, it allows that buyer to make some decisions on whether they wanna continue to move forward because of those issues that came up um, within the inspections. All right, so that's pretty much it for the financing section. Going into the appraisal contingency section, um, there's not a major change here, but I do want to make mention of something that seems to be a, an educational standpoint that we need to have 
on our um, on our contract. And that is that you really can only check one of these boxes if you are doing a, a contract. And the reason why is because even though you may be doing a VA loan or an FHA loan, and you've got those addendums in there, it's really not something that we as an association can say to a VA, uh, you know, to the VA uh, lender or the FHA lender that in addition to their addendum, we've also got this overlay of what we would like to see for the appraisal. The VA and the FHA are very specific on what they require and how their addendums are drafted. And we unfortunately just are not allowed to modify how those programs are you know, in, in instituted into um, into lending. So, um, so if you're doing a VA or an FHA, unfortunately, you can't use Section D. You can only check off those one of those two uh, B or C uh, boxes. If you're doing any kind of other loan product, go for it. Check D if you want it to be um, contingent upon that appraisal, and you can go ahead and and have um, all kinds of language in there about what happens if the appraisal doesn't come in. So that was, um, that's just sort of a point. We just added the word only, so it's check only one, okay? Um, one of the other changes that you're gonna notice is that there's a missing clause here. The time to accept clause is no longer. And a lot of people are gonna be a little bit concerned about that because um, you know it, it was something that our membership had used quite a bit and to try to sort of put a pressure on the seller to make a decision within a certain period of time. But after speaking with our, um, our legal counsel, John Pack and Anderson Lemming, and um, taking a tally of our membership and how they were using this clause, it wasn't being used properly. Um, so it was opening up um, some misunderstandings between a buyer and seller and what it actually means to have that in there and could, con would, could, could potentially create a legal issue. Um, so after uh, speaking with counsel and discussing it a, a lot, quite a bit, we've, we spent quite a few sessions discussing that specific time to accept clause. Uh, it was under the direction of our legal counsel to go ahead and get it removed. And we can talk about that if you'd like a little bit, for, you know, once I've gone through all of the changes. John Pack and Andrew Salemi are both on the line uh, if you have any specific questions, not only on that clause, but on anything else that we've made changes to within our contract. So I'm going to move on to page two, and if you look at page two, uh, you're going to notice not a lot of changes going on up in the commission section, but under counterparts and electronic signatures, that's a, that's a kind of a new heading on how that is worded. Um, counterparts is added, and that basically means that if, if all contracts that are signed are the same contract, but they're all signed on separate copies, they're still considered the same document, and it's still considered an executed contract. Um, we also eliminated the check boxes under all of the buyer and seller section. Um, a little bit of different wording. We had seller's agent rather than listing agent. Um, so that's basically the extent of what we did here. Coming down to section, uh, section nine, no changes. Section 10, under fixtures and other personal property, you'll notice that there's the, the lines that you normally see that you can put your appliances in or whatever other personal property you'd like. But then there's a new sentence below it. And that new sentence has to do with leased items. And if uh, and to let the, any buyer and seller know that leased items are not really conveyed. And there's sort of an example of some of those leased items listed there. And then on this line, uh, you should have the ability to be able to put what you need in there as far as what the leased item is and to, uh, you know, that way everybody's aware of what it is and then there can be proper dialogue between buyer and seller on how those leased items are to be addressed. And the reason we did that is because if you go to your, per, your uh, residential personal property disclosure, um, excuse me, sorry, residential condition, um, property condition disclosure report, this language is in there. It is a question that is asked on that disclosure, but if you know if you know you know about that disclosure, you also know that estates and foreclosures and power of attorneys and other there's other types of other um, sellers out there that don't need to fill that document out, and so it's left with not knowing what's leased and what's not, and so uh, it allows that open dialogue to happen um, if there is no disclosure on the property. Under seller disclosures, notifications, and other seller credits, you'll notice we cleaned this up a bit. 
Um, it used to have a has or has not uh, kind of way of signing it or initialing it. And ECAR, we heard you, this was confusing. And so now we've made it so that if the buyers received the disclosure, initial it. If they haven't, don't initial it, simple as that. So um, that eliminates the need to kind of take a second look at that section to know which area you're supposed to have your buyers initial, okay? All right, um, scrolling down, we continue down to the next section, and this is where you're gonna see a lot of the changes, uh, right under the inspections and tests section. And this was a direct result of hearing from our membership and understanding that uh, it was really cumbersome to keep initialing all those sections um, for where a buyer did or did not want to have inspections. So at the top, you'll notice that we have uh, changed the language a little bit to, uh, to delineate how we're doing it now with the check boxes rather than the initials. So it says to check the appropriate boxes. We still need to have that, that line there for inspections uh, and our tests to be done by a certain date. And then we did box in the lead uh, target housing disclosure that needs to be on our contracts. So that's there too, to sort of uh, focus in so that the buyers and sellers are seeing it. And then on, under the uh, initial section for buyers, you've got A, B, and C. And A indicates whether or not the property is in a target housing, if the, if the buyer wants to waive their right to, to conduct their risk assessment, in other words, their lead paint testing. And if they do want to waive it, they simply initial it, okay? If the buyer wants to waive all inspection or tests, they initial in B. And if they don't, they initial in C, where they want to elect certain uh, inspections and or tests, and then you just check off which ones here that you'd like to do. And if you notice, there's actually one missing from our last contract, it's the mold test. And there was a lot of discussion about that um, because we had the pyrotite uh, issues with the crumbling foundations and about potentially adding that in here as well. But from what we understand, there's no level that's considered a pass fail for pyrotite. And the same thing with mold, there's no pass or fail amount. It's, a, it's all about what the levels are and um, disclosing that and understanding what that means. And so because there's no EPA guideline as far as what those levels could be or, or not be, we decided to remove the mold and to deal with any other kinds of inspections, whether it be a pyrotype from your foundation or your mold or anything else that really you can think of, just check the other box, throw it in there and you're good to go. Section D is another uh, new section as well, and this all has to do with what the seller's responsibilities are, because remember, up in C, the buyer checks that section, initials that section, checks off some of these boxes. All of these items are what the buyer is going to pay for, not the seller. So these are all buyer paid items, okay? When we get down to this, the D section, this is all about what the seller's responsible for. Now the seller is gonna be responsible for providing working utilities, for the inspections if that box is checked. There are gonna be times when you don't need to check that box, especially when you're dealing with some foreclosures or some properties that have you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, the, set, the next section uh, under the check boxes is the cost of the wood destroying organism inspection. Um, and that's obviously something that a lot of times we will have our sellers to pay for on VA loans. And then the third box is for exposing the cover and refilling the excavation on septic. And the fourth is about the pumping and disposal of the sewage, um, which sometimes, again, you have the seller do those things and sometimes not. Um, so you're going to check as appropriate for your particular transaction. Getting into the section 14 about remedies, um, we did make a couple of small changes, but really for the best because um, it wasn't aligning with the way we were doing business. Um, before, under section A, it said, if buyer deems the results of any inspections and or tests to be unacceptable, buyer may request that the seller repair the unacceptable condition. Now, as all you guys know, we don't always ask the seller to repair things. Sometimes we ask for a credit. Sometimes we ask for a lawnmower in, in place of it, or perhaps a, a price reduction. So instead of the word repair, we changed it to the word remedy, just to align more with the way we do business. And then anywhere in the document where there was five, it said five days rather than five calendar days, so that there's a little bit more clarification as to what we're talking about with days, we added the word calendar in front of it. And that's the extent of what we changed under the remedy for inspection section. 
Um, continuing on, I'm gonna go down. Under deposit, you'll notice that um, the way that it's worded is a little bit different, um, allowing you to put a different um, entity under this line rather than the listing broker. Now you can certainly still put the listing broker here. You can, um, you know, so that you know who's going to be making the check payable to for the, the escrow deposit. But there are a lot of times where, you know, the check isn't made out to the listing broker. It's made out to say the attorney. And so that allows you to put that information here in this line rather than always just the listing broker and having to deal with that question under say the additional provisions. Okay, um, and again, the five calendar days we added and continued all the way down. Um, the, under additional provisions, you'll see that there's a lot more lines. We added those lines because we had the room. So if you look at the bottom of the document, there's a little extra room and allowing everyone to put a little bit more detail if need be. I know John and Andrew will tell you to put less detail because obviously you want to stay within the confines of the document. Um, and that's essentially it, except of course, obviously what I talked to you about before, there is that third signature line and there's your dates for your document so that everybody knows where to look to know what date this document is dated for. It's always the last person who dated the document. And that's pretty much all the big changes that we made on the uh, contract. Thank you, Paula. Um, right now, I'd like to circle back to the um, uh, section on the, uh, I think it was the second page where we had time to accept. And I'd like to let uh, John or Andrew or both chime in and just explain to everybody. And John, I've got you unmuted. I had muted you just for your call. So I gave you some privacy there. Well, thank you so much. Um, so Andrew and I both have the same opinion on this, although I'll let him speak for himself. But the, the time for acceptance provision in a contract is unnecessary because the law provides that until such time as a contract is accepted, it can be, it can be uh, revoked by the person who's made the offer. So it was, it was language that was unnecessary. Uh, if, someone wants, if someone wants to put a time frame on their offer, all they have to do is wait for that time frame to expire and then withdraw their offer. And anytime prior to acceptance, it's, it's effective. So uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't necessary. It actually created issues that if, if an offer was accepted after the date set forth in the contract for acceptance, did you have a valid contract or did you have to go back and forth with initials amending that provision? So it was it's something that we've sort of lobbied for for quite some time. There was some resistance at various times and we're happy to see it go. Andrew, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I would just agree that for as long as I've been around and more involved directly with the committee, it was something that um, I advocated to get removed. I think over the years, we changed the may to shall, made minor changes. But when I teach the new member orientation, I you know, address the same concerns that you just brought up. Uh, and if, if the use of it is to pressure the other agent to, to act, you can do that outside of the contract. You can do that through text or email, but it really just added more issues uh, inside the contract, like, like the one John, like the one John indicated. And one, one more thing I will add on a global perspective is uh, it's a good opportunity every time we do one of these revisions is to, for agents and brokers, and brokers especially on, from an education standpoint, is to read the entire document from beginning to end because there are gonna be things in here that didn't change that you'll read and say, oh, I didn't realize it said that. So uh, I would definitely use this as an opportunity. And I know John and I are both available to help um, review this with offices if, that, if that's needed. And, and to, to that point, John, that you just made about um, some of the members, I'm sure, on the buy side are looking to light the fire under the seller. They don't just want the seller to sit on an offer. And I'll, I'll state a good mental picture for everybody. If you've got a buyer that's just in town Saturday and Sunday, they've got a couple properties that they like. They're going after their favorite one. If they, if they said, hey, this is, you're saying your guidance to us is, we've got this out now, put that in a communication that's e uh, email, perhaps would be the correct way to do it saying, this is only good for 24 hours. Would that be appropriate? Is that what you're saying? 
that's not no what i'm saying is at the end of 24 hours withdraw the contract withdraw the offer yeah but if but i'm saying to let the other side know because if, if you just blindly sure. pull the offer in order to just set the table so that the other side knows what you're hoping for right right that that to be a communication either as andrew said via text or via email be from agent to agent so that that's, yeah the other, exactly the other side has a context within which to understand what what your guys are going to do moving forward and then when they get the withdrawal 24 hours later they'll understand that you weren't you weren't fooling around right and actually from on um, you know in in regards to the contract one other thing that kind of dovetails in in terms of um, uh, smart MLS rules require that um, under the deposit, some agents, and we've had this discussion at the broker forum, some agents were uh, of the mindset that I'm not changing status until I receive the deposit. And smart MLS rules require that the contract status be changed um, within, uh, is it, tw now I'm going blank it's either 24 or 48 hours um, of both parties signing and the thought process that the pe people were not you know were not they were waiting for the check to come uh, you know if it was getting FedExed or overnighted they'd wait till it physically came um, the solution to that and to stay in compliance still is change don't let your your seller sign the contract if the seller doesn't, if you want to do that approach, then don't let the seller sign the contract. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> any, any, uh, I, I'd like to open it up. Um, and uh, Susie's monitoring chat. If you want to post a question in chat, we've got uh, Andrew uh, and John both here. So now's the time to ask a question. Uh, and, and I, you know, the whole topic of the, you know, the contract, I think, is, is something that uh, if you've got a question, unmute yourself and let's, let's open it up and have a healthy dialogue here about it. Hi, Greg. I have a question. It's Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Um, either one can answer, Andrew or Jonathan. Thank you so much for taking the time to assist us in breaking this down. Polly did a great job narrating that. Um, we appreciate it. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So here's my scenario playing out in my mind. Of course, I'm hearing this for the first time today on this being removed. I love it for so many reasons, and I agree. Um, but the thoughts that are going through my mind are, what is the other? For instance, sometimes when you make an offer, you don't know how the waters lie. You end up presenting it. The agent notifies you, oh, well, the seller has a lot of um, potential, so they're not going to respond. So no date is a good thing. But let's just say your buyer actually is an investor and they actually have other things they don't want to lose, perhaps. So is there um, an obligation to the buyer? Should they sign their offer unbeknownst to the buyer because they weren't initially given how the land lied when they did make the offer? What's the obligation now of the, of the buyer? I'm not sure. I'm Are they forced to... Are they forced to perform? You, Can they now that the seller signed it, submit a withdrawal? If, no, if the seller signs before the buyer withdraws the offer, then you have a contract. Exactly. So without having but the that time was true frame- with that to, language that in there. Too, right. That I'm was sorry. true with the language in there. Correct, so but in the mind of a buyer, the if contract, they gave them two days and they didn't respond, they're free to do whatever they want. But oh, that's, the, a, that's a fallacy. That's, that really, in, in scheme of the way we actually do things, is sort of a fallacy because I've seen numerous contracts signed by the seller where the date that the seller signed was after the date for acceptance, and everybody mm -hmm. proceeds as if there's a, there's, a, there's a contract. And so in those circumstances, you, there should have been a withdrawal or there should have been initials on both sides. So it's really, it really comes down to communication and the obligation of someone to notify. So if you have a buyer in that circumstance and they want to withdraw the con withdraw their offer, then you communicate a withdrawal. And then as long as you haven't received uh, delivery of the executed document, the contract is terminated. 
obviously anything to do with enforcement or termination of a contract is resolved by a couple of different ways, right? The parties either agree with the resolve or they argue about the resolve. And that's no different in this versus the old circumstance. Yeah, and if I, if I can follow up a little bit there, um, we try to put these forms out uh, to the masses for use by everybody. That doesn't mean there might not be a specific situation, Lisa, where you're dealing with an investor who says to you, your exact situation, you know, I, I only want this for, for, two, for two days, and then I want it revoked. Well, if that's the case, they probably should be talking to their attorney to make sure that their rights are protected. And then if my client said that to me, I would write in the additional provision some language that protects my specific client in that specific situation after they've consulted with me and understands what we're trying to accomplish. But the situation that you explained, it's no different under the old language and kind of illustrates why we made the change because that language doesn't accomplish what most people think it accomplishes. Um, even in that situation that you explained, if the seller, if you said you put the date of April 29th on there, did nothing else, and the seller signed on April 30th, you have a contract, maybe. And that now you get into a battle about what does that contract say. So I think moving, taking it out and then dealing with it on a case by case basis, if you have a specific investor who has hard lines for whatever particular reason there, there may be, similar to the use of time is of the essence or any of those other clauses we try to not put in a uh, boilerplate form for use of the masses. Yeah, it's just the nature of the market can change and the technique of the sellers will say uh, under the advice of their agent can change before you go into it. So for instance, sometimes you know highest and best should be by a certain date and then everybody kind of knows what the playing field is. Other times you, you submit it and then the playing field isn't like even known, right? And so I think that's, I would say the same, you know, if you have a particular, you want to hold on for this because there's no end date for 10 days only, then I think maybe that should be communicated in additional provisions um, for that particular person because maybe they can't afford to buy two places and maybe their work is such that they need to secure something in a period of time. I've seen them drag out when you didn't think so, but you end up in this competitive situation that your client didn't expect to be in. Right, um, right, but keep in mind, Lisa, that the, the language said may be revoked. So it still took an affirmative action by the buyer to actually revoke the offer. Even with that language in there, you still mm -hmm. have to revoke it. So the mechanism to terminate the, the offer is the same now as it was before. Okay. And I, actually, Andrew, let me interject there because that's a question that uh, both uh, Cheryl and Cynthia asked. What is the correct mechanism for a withdrawal of an offer? Um, what is the legal okay. form or would it just be electronic email? It's, that's yeah, the, yeah, the offers, you got to communicate your revocation the offer, offer the other party because keep in mind this holds true if you send a contract over the seller signs it make changes and send it back well now it's the seller's right to revoke that counter offer so it's not it's generally going to be on the buyer side but it can go back the other way but you have to revoke that prior to rec receipt of acceptance of that offer it can be uh, it can take it can take a number of different forms but it should definitely be something in writing sent to the other party that can be memorialized and shown that has a date prior to any potential acceptance and I can tell you, this was years ago when we still used fax machines to communicate. I had an agent call me. They had a, a condo on the market. They put an offer in. And then another unit development went on the market. And the buyer said, ooh, that's a corner, whatever it was, a better unit than the one they wanted. What do I do? And I said, you have to revoke your offer. The listing agent on, on the first condo communicated and said, oh, well, we've already signed it. And so it went to the fax to see who could get either the revocation or the signed offer to the other party first. So if you want to cancel it, you got to get communication to that other party as soon as possible. So, but that's a specific question. They're saying, do we need to utilize a specific form or would the electronic email date stamp suffice? I think it would suffice. John, you agree? 
Yes. As well, we don't have a specific form. Correct. Okay. And then um, you don't have you don't have to worry about the same contractual obligations that you have to form a contract because you're not forming a contract. You're exactly. revoking it all. Right. Uh, okay, I've got a same I've, framework. The formalities of a contract. I've got a question from uh, Dana Gibson uh, speaking to uh, the component of deposit and the uh, cross currents of um, the staying in compliance with smart MLS on the 48 hour uh, status change requirement. Um, and, and I think it was uh, Andrew at the brokers forum last year made it clear uh, that and actually smart MLS uh, uh, had information providing that the status when both parties sign buyer and seller both sign 48 hour clock starts ticking. You have to change the status um, as a listing agent. Now, that uh, discussion of, well, some people didn't want to do it until they received the deposit in hand. And um, can you speak to, and the question specific, can you speak about not signing the contract, the seller not accepting the contract until the deposit is received? How do you guys feel about that? John, John didn't we, weren't we at a, a, a broker meeting yeah. yep. about, but it was more having to do a deposit, no less? Subject I lost to you for a minute, but yeah, that was there were three of us there, and we all had the same opinion. And then there was sort of a maybe a disagreement among the audience and the panel as to how that should be handled. But I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, if you have a signed contract, you have a signed contract, and the receipt of the deposit isn't going to change that. If you, as a seller, are concerned or a seller's agent concerned about receipt of the deposit then your client should not sign the contract until such time as the deposit is received. Just that simple. It's not, it, it's not practical now. I mean, it, we go back to the days where documents were signed, a check was attached, it was dropped off at the listing agent's office. You know, those days have passed. But if the concern exists with respect to receipt of deposit, then the seller can protect themselves 100% by not signing the contract until they have the deposit in their possession. Well, John, let's flip that around though. Right. Let's say and, I've and got if, it. If, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, let's set this up with an out-of-state buyer. COVID-19, virtual showing, go to contract. There is a um, deposits being sent. I do quite a few of these. My client will give me a photo of the bank check or their personal check first personal checks fine on the first one i get tracking numbers i provide that to the uh to the listing agent um and and they now can track it coming in their direction how much is why it's done why are within three hours or four hours in all likelihood they have the money i mean the fact that somebody takes a picture of a check that they wrote the fact that you have a tracking number that doesn't give you any as a listing agent, to me, it doesn't tell me. I, I'm skeptical as hell. So somebody wrote a check, took a picture of it, created a FedEx label, and never sent it. Well, he, the, the only thing with the wire, just ran into it on a, a deal that Cheryl and I did. She knows that what happened. We had, to, we, had problems with, um, we had problems with tracking the wire, satisfying the underwriter so that the underwriter could check the box. Yes, so all funds were sourced. And we're talking a large deposit being wired into a large brokerage, but oh geez, that's in California. You know, it, it's sometimes it's not as easy as you think. But the other thing is that sometimes we have second deposits. So I, I look at it and I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, I will, what what's your re, what's the recourse? Do you want to speak to that? What's the recourse so, if it's not in hand in a reasonable well, period of the, time? So under I don't have the I don't remember where the Susie go right up to the top. paragraph number it is in the new contract. It's in one. Susie can pull that up. Oh, actually, Whether it's the first deposit or any subsequent deposit, the, the language in that escrow deposit section controls about what you do. Like John said, if everyone signs it, you have a contract. Yep. And then from there, well, no, if you go down to the, the, the paragraph that explained, it was old paragraph 20 that's entitled escrow deposits. 
and it says the five days, you got to send certified mail five days, send me the deposit. If you don't, then we can terminate. Uh, but that, yeah, 19. So to do, if you don't get a deposit made in sec require section one, and that, that holds true of the initial thousand up front or the second thousand uh, later on after inspections or however you're going to do it, the highlighted section there tells you what you have to do in order to terminate this agreement. But a lot of people think, and John hit on this, well, they signed the contract, but they never gave me a deposit, so we don't have a contract. I don't have to update MLS, and I can just go to sell to somebody else. And that is not at all. And we try to give advice that we know isn't always, not try to give, we give advice that isn't always the most practical for your given situation. John hit the nail on the head. The perfect way to do it is to not have the seller sign until the check's received, but we understand that that's not always either feasible or in the best interest given that specific situation. And it's okay that you don't do it that way, but you got to understand the ramifications. And for, for that question, you just ask Greg, you'd have to go through paragraph 19 to figure out how to move forward. I thank you for putting our eyes on section 19, because here's the other thing. Let's say I'm putting a sizable deposit. I don't know that as a buyer, I want to send a deposit to somebody when I, when they haven't accepted Show me proof that you've accepted it and I'll tender the deposit. It's subject to collection. Sure. Right, right there, section 19 has everybody's interest covered, I think. Um, well, so subject thank you. To collection, subject to collection means the process, I, I, at least I understand subject to collection meaning uh, through the bank process of collecting a check through, yep. through clearinghouse and, and uh, Etc. So I, I don't think I don't think that the intent of that is to defer payment of it until such time as the document's been signed. But but your language right here, and, and I heard I think you and I'll back fast roll back a flashback to Toby. You always think about what does the agreement speak to, and the agreement says five days right there. So if the agreement well, says five days, right? No, no, no. The agreement says that it's payable by initial deposit with this agreement, comma, subject to collection. So. Oh, no, I'm looking at 19, the one that. Right. We were, but 19 is saying if it's not made when it's supposed to be made, here's what you do. Right. But paragraph 1A says it's payable by initial deposit with this agreement. Got it. And 19 is just what kicks in if it's not, if it's not there. Look, I, I know most times you, you, it happens the way you're explaining. You get a picture of it and it's, it's followed up later. And usually it's not an issue, but it, it can become a problem. And it's just making sure that the agents and brokers understand the mechanism of how it works so that if they're in the situation, they know how to act. And, and the other thing, actually, John, um, the wire transfer, that verbal confirmation is super critical. I don't trust anybody's wire instructions. I tell every single client they've got to verbally confirm. And no, no doubt. No doubt. And Andrew, you know, you agree with that, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I was, I was hacked last year, so I completely agree with you, one hundred percent. Awesome. Um, let me try to catch up with a few more of the questions. Um, so we've got um, actually uh, Cindy to, to just close the tie the knot. I've never heard of a buyer not supplying a check and, and um, people don't want to give their banking info. Um, I don't know what that last part is, but I think that there's not that much of a, I don't, that this whole scenario that we just talked about how real, I, I have to agree with Cindy a little bit on that. Um, Susie's got a point, um, video explanation, a copy of the contract. We will have that up um, for everybody to see. She's going to share it on a YouTube link so everybody can um, watch Paula's uh, live presentation that she just did. We're going to have uh, uh, another one available to you, though, through YouTube. That'll be emailed to everybody. Um, Kathleen uh, Pellerin uh, has got a question. She's confused. Um, how can we not have the seller sign until the deposit's received? We're circling back to that same topic. Contract is not valid until both parties sign. So why would a deposit be sent until we know the contract signed? And that was my point. I did not see that 
question, uh, Kathleen, and I think we covered that. Um, any, we've got legal counsel here, and again, uh, they are volunteering their time to try to help us stay in compliance, and uh, now's the opportunity to toss out any other um, questions. Uh, anyone else got some questions? Hi, it's Dana. Can you hear me, Gibson? Yes. Hi, Dana. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to comment that Coldwell Banker in Essex, where I work out of, the, we're not even taking checks. It's all wire right now due to the COVID-19. And I have a feeling it's just going to continue that way. So is there any, I guess, I don't know, concerns, comments that legal can make to that? Well, I mean, the... The only thing I could say relating to that is that everybody needs to be careful with respect to the use of wires because communicating through email and, and uh, puts us all at risk with respect to hijacked wiring instructions. It's amazing that these guys, you know, guys, girls sit in Nigeria, sit in, in Europe in their underwear and figure out a way to get this money from us and we are a targeted industry with respect to wire fraud there's right. a lot of money changing hands and these guys know it so it's very important when you're communicating wiring instructions that you communicate them in a secure way through right. a secure portal or okay. through a secure email and that that anybody that you instruct your clients that anyone who's being who's asking you to send a wire should be contacted at a verified number to ensure that the information that they have is correct. Okay. Um, you know, we, this started many years ago. Uh, the first time it happened to us, we had given a check to a, a seller and we received an email from the other attorney saying, uh, oh, please put a stop payment on the check and wire funds to uh, a, a, in a, a, bank account, a Bank of America bank account. And, and things have become a lot more sophisticated now in terms of how they intercept and get involved in transactions. So it's just very important that people be vigilant with respect to the communication and use of wiring instructions. Okay. And, and one more note on that, if I could too, is if, yeah. if you are in that situation, and you know, a wire is going to be required, you might want to make sure that your, your client, the funds are in an account that is liquid and available to wire from, because a lot of people have never wired before Right. And it's coming out of a brokerage account that needs X, Y, Z days or so just make sure that you're, you're understanding and educating your clients on the process and, and making sure that they're ready to, to do what needs to be done. Yeah. And let, let me speak a little bit to the, the setup. Uh, I don't, I, I don't want to take for granted that everybody understands how this wire fraud happens. What really, and I'll make it, relatively short. If you want to talk to me about in detail, I'll talk to you offline about it. But really what happens is we have situations where um, Yahoo, um, all, all emails have been hacked. Uh, but I'll, I'll, if you're not using secure communications, and what I mean by secure uh, communications, um, some agents have sent me email inbound and it goes into what's called quarantine. And it's because it's failing uh, SPF or DKIM authentication uh, because they, they're not having their email outbound server setting set. So it's vulnerable. The hackers, what happens is they know you are a professional. They know you are dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars of client money. And these hackers, what they do is they'll just see, if they intercept your email, and they see this transaction that's going to be closing on May 30th. They will just sit there and stalk and they will just let the communication go back. And they're taking notes. They're saying, oh, okay, the buyer's attorney is this person. Um, and they're just waiting for, um, and, and it actually, don't just think it's you. It's more so your client, your client's email flow. When that wire instruction comes in that wire instruction gets intercepted. So the, the, literally it's in the inbox and they grab it. And then they take that um, letterhead from 
John Peck's office and they change that wire instruction that they take, keep the letterhead the same, they take the number, the account number, and put that account, tweak it to be Nigeria. And then if the buyer just fires it off and does not go and pick up the phone and call John's office and confirm that account number, it's gone, it's offshore. And so it's critical that verbal confirmation happen. The second thing that I just wanna point out to all members is please do not use um, public Wi-Fi. Don't use Starbucks. Yes, you can use it, but better be using a VPN. A VPN encrypts everything that's in and out. Um, if you are sitting there on public, and a VPN is cheap, guys. It's about 10 bucks or 15 bucks a year. And I use Nord if I'm in a public environment, non-secure. So uh, John can tell you um, it's, it's real. Andrew had a personal experience. Andrew, what do you think in terms of uh, man hours you lost and how much, um, how, how, what was the cost to you as a company? I, it, it, was, it wasn't the man hours I lost. It was the years off the back end of my life and the additional gray hairs that I got. Um, right. But you explained the process pretty well. Um, you know, and mine, um, they didn't get any money out of me. And, and generally that's the, they can't, our, our accounts are secure. They can't get in there, but they're just looking to trip, trip you up. And, and they attacked both me and my clients. The reason I found out was the file that I had with John's office. And it was uh, end of the month where I was incredibly summertime and it was not fun at all. Um, but yeah, it's there and it can happen. Uh, just to, to the ver verbal verifications and trust. I mean, it was to the point where people were calling a phone number and somebody was answering the phone to confirm these wrong wiring instructions. So that's how uh, intricate it was. Um, and, so and just be just be very careful. Yeah, and one other thing on that note that I forgot to mention would be that even on the check copies that I send to. Uh, the other side or to the, you know, to the bank, typically the lender wants to see the copy of the check. Uh, and if I was sending it to the other side, I eradicate and black out the account number and the routing number. I think everybody here probably knows by now that if you have a routing number and you have the um, bank account number, someone can just go and order checks and clear out the account. So everything you can possibly do to protect uh, your client is in, important. Uh, we have another new question that wanted to scroll down to the remedy section. Um, so on the remedy section, um, and this question is from uh, Lisa, um, uh, just a question regarding the remedy clause. Uh, I have a question regarding the remedy clause form. Yes. So on section 14, it talks about the remedies for inspection. Currently, there is a form that many use called the remedy clause. And there is where all buyers will enter their to-do list. Um, at the bottom of that form, it states that this is to become part of the purchase and sales agreement. I hear 90% of the time that the agents never submit it to the bank. But if it's not submitted to the bank, then we would be in error of appropriating the purchase and sale agreement. Um, which raises questions like, for instance, say we have a clean house that has no problem going BA, but now we've just entertained four different things that had nothing to do with the appraisal. You would be provoking, and I'm wondering if anyone saw this basically, wouldn't you be provoking now maybe a reappraisal for um, that loan type uh, because you've added um, this? you really should be adding it because it says states right there that it's not basically a side note it becomes part of the purchase and sales so i don't like that form um simply because there's a lot of thought that has to go into it and if it is used it has to really be um weighed out and submitted what if the attorneys seen on that how are they are they seeing this form part of the purchase and sale coming in um or are they not seeing it in their files? Andrew, sorry, I was distracted. You're gonna have to jump in on that. Uh, um, 
I don't think it matters that it says that that this is a, a addendum to the purchase and sales agreement or not. If the parties to a purchase and sales agreement are signing a an addendum to it, it's a part of the purchase and sales agreement. So whether or not that clause is in there, if you're signing something addressing the contract, it's an addendum that needs to be disclosed to the lender. That, exactly. That's, that's exactly. it. Exactly. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if the form, and that kind of illustrates, and I saw one this morning where the addendum came through and it said, basically, I'm giving you $1,000 because this is broken and I'm going to give you $1,000 because that's broken. When you're drafting these addendums, you really need to be talking to your lenders and mortgage brokers and figure out, let them know what you're trying to accomplish so it can be done in a way that will satisfy the underwriting requirements. Um, generally, they're going to want to see credits, but the minute you start referencing repair issues that the credit is, is intended to, to cover instead of closing cost credit, then mm -hmm. now the lender is going to get involved. So, right. and I think John will agree, one of the biggest issues we have in the efficiency of conducting a closing is when we sit down and go over something and the client says, well, where's that credit? We signed an addendum and we never saw it. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so I, it seems to me, it seems as though the field will say the field, because I can educate my own right. office. But it seems like in the field that the agents aren't really understanding the cause and effect in the process of the loan or the contract in using that particular form. Um, and of course, the we don't want to be part of any mortgage fraud because you know the lender is supposed to see all of those things. So I just was wondering how you guys find it um, because I find it a challenge that particular form. I don't know. I hear more than not people don't submit it, and that disturbs me. That was all. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think Cindy's got another question here um, about a buyer wiring from their own account, um, not a family or friend's account uh, that isn't, oh, to, I think it is to uh, make sure that it's you know coming from a, um, the buyer's account not a family or friend, um, tracking, uh, the tracking the lender needs um, has to be from the buyer, which is always known, and when it's uh, written on the check, uh, but not necessarily known by us on a wire. So right. that's, that's the situation that I ran into, um, uh, share, uh, I'm sorry. Um, Cindy. 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 Yeah, and and I I had that I had that uh, similar situation. The wire was just it was just wonky in terms of a little bit more difficult to track. Um, did you have a, a, something specific on that, Cindy? That that you wanted to get clarified? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. I did not. Can you hear me? There, you, we got you now. Thank you. No, I did not. I just did lending for a ton of years before I was a realtor. So I know that, you know, the seeing where that check's coming from, the lender or the payment of the deposit is a huge deal for the, um, for the mortgage company. So I think we easily see that as agents when they give us the copy of the check, whether it's a picture of it for it's mailed or in person, we see that. But if they're doing a wire, we're not necessarily seeing where that's coming from. So that could become an issue later on with the lender. Just more of a statement than, than it was a question. Yeah, and I, I'm gonna throw something else out um, to that point. Uh, Keith Turner and I had a pleasure of uh, a parent helping out a buyer. Um, the parent had heard about the $15,000 gift uh, tax limitation um, and the parent wrote four checks out four checks at 15,000, 15,000 to the daughter, 15,000, 15,000 to the, um, uh, not husband, boyfriend, but they were engaged. And it all had to be sourced. And well, what was it? Te technically they weren't engaged. So that made it even more uh, confusing. Well, so was, the, yeah. the, in <laughs> the interesting thing about that is there's not a penalty to a person that's helping their son or daughter. That fifteen thousand beyond that is not taxable. It just goes against your one point four 
um, million dollars was where it was. It's 1.58 million in 2020 lifetime cap. So there was a form that gets filed. If you give 20,000, you're going to take five. Uh, if you give 20,000, let's say, or in this case, this woman gave 60,000, there's only one person. Uh, let's worry about this boyfriend part. Let's just say it's 60,000 to the daughter. 15,000 goes no problem on an annual basis. The 45,000 that was trying to go to the daughter would go against her 11.5 million lifetime cap of given. So all she's do, got to do is file that form and it's gonna, they're gonna take that down by 45,000. So um, another little thing that we learn something new every day is uh, uh, agents and brokers. Um, I think that's it. Um, I don't see any new questions and I, I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of your day. Um, and it's really special to see each of your faces here because we, we have not been able to uh, have our uh, awards banquet and um, our retirement party yet, but we've got that on the slate for June 10th, is it Susie? Let me see. It's currently June 10th and next yep. Wednesday we have another live virtual membership meeting where we're inviting all of the affiliates to be on board um, and share with the realtor community how COVID-19 has impacted our business. Um, um, and um, I, a, couple, a couple quick things. I've gotten a few calls um, on um, when a buyer walks away from a contract due to an inspection issue and the, the listing agent knows about it, they need to disclose it. They need to get their seller to update their property condition disclosure report and I'm not going to open that can of worms I'm just going to say that period um, I'm also I've gotten a couple of calls on social media teams that are putting out Facebook stuff um, they have their own Facebook page for a team just be sure that you have a quick um, link to your parent company your brokerage firm that's a requirement, I believe, by law, and it's certainly a requirement of the Code of Ethics. Um, those are a couple of things that have come to my desk, so be sure you're still um, out there um, following the Code of Ethics, even with COVID-19, and call me with any questions or concerns. And the last thing is to stay on top of the changes as we get them. CTR, Susie, if you could just uh, you're not sharing your screen anymore, but the um, CTR site, you go right to CTR Realtors, at the very top, the COVID-19 um, update, there's a link right at the top of the bar. You hit that button and you're going to constantly see but photographers are now essential services. You get your professional photos done, uh, get 3D tours done. Um, Smart MLS has some great uh, tools for you. Right Built right into Smart MLS, we've got the um, uh, Immo Viewer, uh, which is a 3D tour that you can do yourself with your smartphone. Don't have to buy anything. If you want to get a little fancier, about 300 bucks, you can get a 3D camera and uh, do them yourself if you're not so inclined. But the oh, that just are... reminded me, Greg, about the open house too. There was questions about, can you do an open house, uh, virtual or live? Well, um, the answer to that question was, um, the governor's orders are that you need to be six feet apart or wear a mask. Um, and that real, real, real estate is an essential part of our business right now. So can you do a live open house? Yes. Do you need to follow the governor's restrictions on, on social distancing? Yes. CTR has put out guidelines and they don't advise it. They don't recommend open houses, but it's not breaking the law. With that, thank you everybody. And uh, Greg, next I have Okay. Greg, I have one thing real quick. Um, oh, just, there you go. Uh, just a quick, quick nod out to everybody. Thank you all for um, for listening today to the changes and for participating on that level. But as um, the chair of the forms committee, I do want to personally invite anyone who has any uh, passion for forms, uh, wordsmithing, and for trying to think outside of the box on how to make our forms better for our membership. Our next tackle is the listing agreement. And so if you are interested in that, uh, please reach out to both me or Susie, and we will definitely get you on a Zoom call and get you going. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week, same time. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>